in the first portion of the book, uh, there were a variety of sections which I wanted to draw people's attention to last time. <clears throat> um, I'll speed through some of this until I get toward the middle because um, some of it may be repetitious for those who were here last time. Everything in Pascal's work hinges upon his way of relating reason to revelation, faith and reason together. Um, he says here in 173, if we submit everything to reason, our religion will be left with nothing mysterious or supernatural. If we offend the principles of reason, our religion will be absurd and ridiculous. If you've read Pascal, you will see that this is a characteristic of his diction. He poses a, a juxtap juxtapositions. He puts two principles together, which form a whole. He believes that they're like concave and convex, although on the surface they may be, appear to be a little different. We need the kind of uh, reason which is open to religion and the kind of religion which is open to reason. And this quote here indicates why he thinks that. As I said, he's certainly in the debt of St. Augustine. He mentions him and then says in his own words, reason would never submit unless to judge that there are occasions when it ought to submit. It is right then that reason should submit when it judges that it ought to submit. Notice the high view of reason here. Augustine had said, I believe in order that I may understand. Pascal is not terribly different. Pascal emphasizes the importance of reason's role. But as is characteristic in all of his work in the Pensees, Pascal here emphasizes um, what reason's task is, what its job is. And its job is to evaluate evidence, reasoning or reasons, this is reason's job, to see what conclusions it needs to submit itself to. In this respect, this is not characteristic of theological reasoning, but of all reasoning, according to Pascal. Remember, he's a a mathematician and a physicist. And what he concluded in the empirical sciences uh, is fully applicable here, according to Pascal. In any of the physical sciences, the reasoner, the investigator, the scientist uh, inquires and searches out the evidence to see which explanation is the most compelling one. And when that reasoning mind of a scientist discovers that one explanation fits best, it then embraces that explanation, at least for purposes of additional research uh, and ex examination. Reason is seeking answers to questions. Reason likes good questions and maybe there need to be better questions, but reason would be kind of self-referential and impotent if it didn't seek to find answers to the questions that animated its inquiry. Reason has to submit, but reason should only submit when it judges that it ought to submit. In other words, based on 174 here, when should reason submit? Well, it should submit when it itself judges that it ought to. This is pivotal when it comes to matters of faith in God. I find it intriguing uh, that Pascal has several important arguments about uh, what disagreement means in the, the inquiry of the rational mind. He notes here in 176, those who do not love truth excuse themselves on the grounds that it is disputed and that very many people deny it. But as he notes in the next section, Contradiction is a poor indication of truth. Many things that are certain are contradicted. Many that are false pass without contradiction. Contradiction is no more, no more an indication of falsehood than lack of it is an indication of truth. Contradiction means that people disagree. Is it possible that people could disagree about something where there is actually a right answer? Of course it is. We experience that all the time. It may be for a variety of reasons. It may be that some people have less information or are less well-skilled in the subject matter. People may disagree, but that hardly proves that there's no correct answer to uh, scientific or philosophical questions. <clears throat> there are many things that are certain that in fact people contradict all the time. And there are many false things that go by without any contradictions. So don't think that just because people disagree that there's no truth available. This is really an elementary point of logic, uh, but for Pascal, uh, it's very important. Let's avoid two excesses, excluding reason or admitting nothing but reason. Reason's last step. <clears throat> this was a major subject of our discussion last time. Reason's last step is the recognition that there are an infinite number of things which are beyond it. It is merely feeble if it does not go as far as to realize that. Reason's last step. Would it be reasonable for reason to come to the conclusion that there is nothing beyond its ability to grasp. Clearly not. That would be unreasonable. It would be a, 
a failure of the vocation of rationality to draw the conclusion that there was nothing beyond the ken of reason. In fact, there are a lot of reasons, a lot of evidence to suggest that there are things that we don't fully understand <clears throat> and are likely not ever fully to understand. And therefore, it would be unreasonable to assume that there's nothing beyond reason. But that means that there may be things that reason can lead us toward but can't not enable us to embrace. The reality of God, his character, his existence, his relation to us is obviously the most important of all of these. If there are reasons to think that there's something beyond the physical, beyond the natural order, if that something seems purposive, if there seems likely to be a God, it seems also likely, reasonable to think that we'd be, uh, would be, that, that God would be beyond our ability fully to fathom, fully to understand. It would be at least partly beyond reason. And reason itself recognizes the need to identify something that at least is partly beyond itself. It is merely feeble, says Pascal, if it does not realize that. <clears throat> or perhaps it is self-referential or puffed up. Reason is weak if it thinks that there's nothing but reason. Let me take a little detour here and note that in two simple sentences, Bless Pascal uh, anticipates all the problems that attend what is called the philosophy of naturalism, uh, which means in this context, the claim or the doctrine that no phenomena exist other than physical, empirical, observable phenomena. No, no other phenomena exist. And of course, the problem with that is myriad, not least of which is that the human mind, which claims to have discovered that there are no phenomena beyond the tangible, the material, the natural, the empirical in that sense, the human mind that claims to have discovered that is itself something that cannot be fully explained in terms of the merely physical and merely empirical. Moreover, <clears throat> it's important to notice uh, that this notion of naturalism uh, imagines that it's operating within a closed system, that there are no causes that are beyond the ken, in principle, beyond the ken of empirical testability. Now, can empirical testing demonstrate that there is nothing beyond the reach of empirical testing? It seems clear, logically speaking, that empirical testing would not be able to prove that there is nothing beyond empirical testing. Instead, it is an assumption. In fact, according to Blaise Pascal, it's the kind of assumption that would demonstrate that reason is feeble as opposed to robust. This is ironic because many of the great advocates of reason alone imagine themselves to be the most reasonable of all, but according to Pascal, they're not. Section 199 is very long. I invite you to read it. I'm not going to linger as long on it today as I did last time, but Pascal points out uh, the remarkable position of man that we are uh, between extremes of the infinitely great and the infinitely small. He says, such is our true state. This is what makes us incapable of certain knowledge or absolute ignorance. Notice the position that Pascal situates man in. We are incapable of certain knowledge, but we are also incapable of absolute ignorance. <clears throat> we can't know everything, and yet we can't affirm that we know nothing. Neither one is satisfactory. This is one of Pascal's most famous statements. Man is only a reed, the weakest in nature, but he is a thinking reed. Now, let me pause here. This is a good, good place for me to pause and see if anybody would like to make a comment. What do you think he means by man is a thinking reed? Read. What's the significance of the of the metaphor? Bob Brilowski, and I'm going to unmute Bob. Okay. Okay. It's just that read is a is a lot of biblical metaphor about reeds, and that man being like a frail reed. I think Isaiah in particular, by the hand. So he's making it a. So in talking about a reed, he's he's ref, picking up on his biblical uh, metaphor here that of being something that can be bent or broken. Mm. or perhaps bruised, but then there's, of course, the phrase that a smoking reed or smoking wick. Yeah, you're know, referring to God. something in Isaiah, I believe. Yeah. So I think he's obviously thinking biblically here and kind of saying oh, we're weak, but we're strong, which I think is another theme of Pascal relating to his incarnational views about that. Mm -hmm. So I think he's it's just part of his, but again, you know, He's always thinking, seems to be thinking a lot in terms of metaphor and analogy rather than, okay, I think that's about all I have to say. 
Thank you very much. Okay, Aran Rogerson, I'm going to uh, lower your hand and I'm going to unmute you. There, Aran. Um, hi. Um, well, I remember you from last time. Hi, nice to see you again. Do you? Okay, good to see you. Uh, yeah, man is only a reed, the weakest in nature. Um, my interpretation is uh, he's commenting on the naturalistic point of view that man is no different than other material objects. He is being reduced down to something that is just a speck of dust in the universe and yet he is a thinking raid so <clears throat> there is something about him where he knows his own existence so sure he might be reduced down to materials but he is clearly not just a material thing and there is great power in that so there's a dual sort of he is nothing and yet he is everything kind of right exactly sort of feeling I mean, who's ever heard of a reed that can think? It's just, that's actually not a phenomenon that we see in nature. And yet when we look at human beings, we see their incredible weakness, frailty, incompleteness, misery sometimes. And in the midst of all of that, they're also thinking about their own situation, trying to identify uh, the better from the worse, the noble from the base. Uh, that thinking quality is um, very unusual. Okay, now I've got Sarah. I see Sarah has a hand up and I'm going to try and unmute Sarah. Are you there, Sarah? Thank <clears throat> Go you. ahead. Yeah, so I'm looking at the phrase, the weakest in nature, and I'm wondering, is there some, is he like looking at the order of being and seeing man as the highest there, but he's somehow also the weakest? Yes. I'm sure, like how to interpret nature, like whether it's a metaphysical concept here. Right, clearly there's a kind of ranking of, kinds of being, um, but not uh, in a merely speculative way. He has elaborated at length in ways that I haven't you know, given you all the words to, but he's elaborated at length on the weakness of man, uh, which is observable. <clears throat> uh, so, and yet also elaborated at length upon the rationality of man, which is also observable. Uh, this ranking of man as in the middle of the natural order below things above him and above things below him uh, is um, clearly metaphysical in character, but not uh, capricious. Anybody else before I go on? Number 200 is where we're Right, uh, continuing a bit, but again, I'm watching, I'm watching my sidebar, and some of you are getting the hang of doing this. We're, we're, this is a work in progress for everybody, right? <clears throat> so do our best. So speaking of man's situation, <clears throat> Knowing God without knowing our own wretchedness makes for pride. Knowing our own wretchedness without knowing God makes for despair. Knowing Jesus Christ strikes the balance because he shows us both God and our own wretchedness. Christ is, he said, Jesus is a God whom we can approach without pride and before whom we can humble ourselves without despair. Uh, clearly, what's going on here is that uh, he's noticing the unique character of the, the incarnation. God lowers himself to take on human nature. This very human nature, which as we have said before, is so frail but remarkable as to be a thinking reed. He lowers himself to join us in our lowness, but also because our lowness is of great value. If our lowness were not of great value, God couldn't have assumed human nature in Jesus Christ because it would have been degrading to him. But in fact, there was nothing degrading to God to become incarnated in Christ. There was only a lowering, a humbling, a humility demonstrated, but not a degradation, which gives us hope because if our nature is so far valuable that the ultimate God of all could in fact assume our human nature, then our human nature must have something to say for it that's rather on the good side, uh, but uh, not so much as to turn us into prideful uh, competitors with God. He says in reflection after he says about the whole nature of man, for a religion to be true, it must have known our nature. It must have known its greatness and smallness and the reason for both. What other religion but Christianity has known this? Well, one could reflect upon that and, and think about what other religion has known both his man's greatness and his smallness. I'm no expert on comparative religion, but let me hazard a few thoughts. And of course, you're free to respond to these. Uh, 
let's think about uh, the great religions of the subcontinent, the Asian subcontinent, um, particularly uh, Buddhism, which tells us that all human desire is illusion and which posits, at least at its highest level, uh, Buddhism posits that uh, the, the highest state of existence is nirvana, which ultimately means nothingness, which is to say the uh, disappearance, the evacuation um, of the human experience, uh, fully revealed as having been insignificant and illusory, uh, and thus a transcendence is somehow attained by which you transcend uh, all the facets of human experience. This suggests not the combination of greatness and smallness, but somehow uh, the idea that humanness uh, should be disdained and escaped, escaped from. Quite the contrary uh, of the incarnation. Thus, when you think about the concept of nirvana, which is uh, nothingness, uh, or the statement on Mount Sinai from the God who spoke to Moses and said, I am that I am. There couldn't be two greater polar opposites between I am on the one hand and nothingness on the other. If there is some sort of equivalent of enlightenment in Judaism and Christianity, therefore, it is not the escape from humanness and from one's own consciousness, but rather the uniting of one's person with this God who says, I am. Very different from the evacuation self, which we find uh, in Buddhism. You can do that kind of thought experiment with other religions and, um, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. Those are mine in a very preliminary way. I'm just following him. <clears throat> okay, I'm recognizing Bob Rolofsky, who has a hand up. Bob? You seem to have passed over a little bit, Judaism, a little quickly there. I'm thinking of the psalm, as soon as you said that, I'm thinking of the psalm, what is man to doubt? Remember, I'm not right on there takes note of him i take note of him with the son of man that you know so he's kind of like he, he david made him a little lower he, than the angels yeah so he seems to be aware of that kind of polar and he seems to have awareness of that of that being in between there mm -hmm. definitely so i don't sure but again i think a lot of, of course a lot of christian thought comes sort of out of you know the new testament shows the old testament and the, and Old Testament is, is uh, revealed in the New Testament, so mm -hmm. there's, there's going to be a lot of overlap between the two. And I don't know if this is a time to say that I'm really appreciate being able to have this opportunity here because I'm out. I moved out to Tennessee in the fall, and so I haven't been able to come to the Lewis Society meetings here. Oh, okay. So this is kind of a opportunity to uh, interact with some of the uh, with, with the society again. So uh, that's okay. great. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's one benefit of having to do it uh, virtually via Zoom, I guess, isn't it? Continuing on here. <clears throat> it's interesting, his attitude toward believers who are not as rational as he himself is. This is one of Pascal's uh, virtues, I think, certainly one of his unique traits. Um, he says here, I freely admit that one of these Christians who believe without proof will perhaps not have the means of convincing an unbeliever who might say as much for himself, but those who do know the proofs of religion can easily prove that this believer is truly inspired by God, although he cannot prove it himself. Now, based upon not only this bit of a text here, but the general thrust of the pensées, it's clear that Pascal has a great regard for simple believers who seem simple. He is far from being one of those to say, well, if you can't try it out, you know, your rational syllogisms to demonstrate why you believe, then your belief is invalid. That's, that's not Pascal's approach. And the reason it's not Pascal's approach, we'll revisit several times here, but the reason is that as Pascal sees the vocation of reason, it's the enterprise of reason. Reason is trying to find the answers to the big questions of human existence. Why are we here? What are we for? Is there a God, an intent, intentional mind, 
before and in and beyond all that we observe. If there were such a mind or such a being or such a purpose, um, then the aim of our reflections, our rational reflections, would be not merely just to state propositions on paper, as it were, but to somehow be united with that great being who exists. And the purpose of all the rational inquiry would be to get us to the point where our reason would enable us accurately to point our loving heart in an embrace toward that great being. But that means that the purpose of everything is that embrace and that the reasoning process toward it is a means to the end. He loves the means to the end. In fact, so do I. And I admire his development of the means to the end. But for the, for the very reason that it's a means to an end, we shouldn't turn our noses up, as it were, on people who skip some of the intervening steps and go straight to the embrace, the loving embrace of the one toward whom reason points. He simply notes here that such a person may not be able to give us all the you know, intervening steps, rationally speaking, but we could provide it for him. But it's okay because he's truly inspired by God, such a person. That thought will return to a little later in the book. <clears throat> Notice the relation between divine and human nature. Man's true nature, his true good and true virtue and true religion are things that cannot be known separately. Cannot be known separately. There are reasons for this in biblical theology, obviously, because man is made imago dei, which means to understand himself, he needs to understand the one in whose image he's made. But even if you didn't accept, as of yet, the biblical revelation about the imago dei, you would still see that the significance of the universe in which we live um, has to be explored by the human mind. And the human mind's place in this order uh, are an important clue, uh, a very important clue as to the meaning of the whole. I'm speaking now outside the confines of Jewish or Christian theology, simply in terms of the process of inquiry that reason must undertake. It seems that man himself and his inquiry into the meaning of everything can't be regarded as being anything other than some important clue toward that. And so for all these reasons, these things are intertwined in our ability to know them. Our nature, our true good, and true religion, they all are connected. Ha, huh. yeah, this is, a, this is a lovely one here. <clears throat> Instead of complaining that God has hidden himself, you will give him thanks for revealing himself as much as he has. And you will thank him too for not revealing himself to wise men full of pride and unworthy of knowing so holy a God. Two sorts of persons know him. Those who are humble of heart and love their lowly state, whatever the degree of their intelligence, high or low, and those who are intelligent enough to see the truth, however much they may be opposed to it. Now, the first category, um, I guess intellectual people can smile maybe benignly and think about that first category. Yes, they're those humble people, they're probably low in intelligence, you know, they probably cling to, cling to religion and so forth. Uh, they're probably easily led. Um, those of you who know some of the illusions I'm making uh, may smile as I make them. We could look deprecatingly upon such people. <clears throat> but his comment about the other group is quite interesting and maybe a little less common. There are those who are intelligent enough to see the truth, however much they may be opposed to it. Notice the interesting aspiration to um, fair-mindedness, uh, to a real process of inquiry that seeks to set aside its own prejudgments and preconceptions in order to get at the truth. He admires those, and I think so should we, whose intelligence is such that they may come to see the truth even though they disliked it, even though they disliked it. In fact, one of the most interesting things in the course of Christian history uh, has been those thinkers who were profoundly opposed to the Christian faith, um, who then, in spite of their opposition, gradually came to change their mind and to embrace it. 
uh, there's a wonderful book by Malcolm Muggeridge. I think it's called Conversions, if I, I'm not getting the title quite right, um, which he narrates conversions of many uh, great 20th century people who were opposed to the Christian faith, but ultimately came to embrace it, perhaps reluctantly. 397 gives us a glimpse at how uh, Pascal's Jansenism, which is to say his Augustinianism, influences his view of human nature. Bob, did you want to make a comment? Just a quick comment. This is Lewis Society, and of course Lewis referred to himself as the most reluctant convert. Yes, right. And that's a little bit later in the book. We'll see how um, Lewis uh, sees just that. Excuse me, that Pascal sees just that. He himself um, doesn't want to follow just his own upbringing, but he wants to resist it if necessary. And so Lewis is similar. So now I'm, I'm talking here on 397 about uh, what would be perhaps a Pascal's picture of nature, certainly human nature. Since man's true nature has been lost, anything can become his nature. Similarly, true good being lost, anything can become his true good. Now, uh, this is a very radical statement. This is a statement that would have been um, disturbing to Je the Jesuits of the Counter-Reformation, disturbing to any good Thomist, uh, disturbing, in fact, to, to many people. Um, man's nature has been lost. Anything can become his nature. Um, there's a, a term uh, used in contemporary philosophy uh, that encapsulates this concept. Uh, it's plasticity. The idea of man's nature being plastic, that is shapeable into anything. Surely, <clears throat> we would like to believe, I would like to believe, Surely, there's something about human nature which would prevent them from descending to the lowest of lows of depravity and distortion. Surely, there'll always be uh, something good about human beings still to be discerned and observed. Not clear, not clear, perhaps, though, uh, in actual practice. Could it be that man's nature has been so lost that he could become virtually anything? Is he fully plastic? Or is there in fact a kind of enduring set of characteristics of human nature, which though they may be truncated and though they may be limited, will always be present? This is a, a perennial question in philosophy. Pascal's view is quite radical. Um, Pascal's view is the kind of view which someone like Nietzsche could have embraced if he took just this one sentence and ripped it out of the pensées and took it away entirely from the rest of the theological content of Pascal's work. If this alone, what Pascal had left, had left us, uh, then in fact, it's possible that Friedrich Nietzsche might have agreed. Anything can become man's nature. This is a frightening vision of human degradation. Is it accurate? <clears throat> is it accurate? This is just an opportunity for opining, not for being conclusive, but I would welcome a few thoughts if you have some. Is man's nature really this plastic? Or alternatively, you could say that to believe that man's nature is this plastic, that anything can become his nature, is a dangerous belief which could lead to the very thing that it describes, and that therefore we should uh, abjure the belief, not because it's false, but because it's dangerous. That's another way of approaching this. What do you think? Okay, I've got Mark here, and now I'm going to unmute Mark. Okay, I mean, it just seems to me obvious that having come through the 20th century with people like Adolf Hitler, that there's plenty of truth to that statement that's undeniable. Yes, doesn't it in fact seem that way? Uh, others might have said that prior to World War I, it might have seemed more plausible, because World War I was itself such a disturbing uh, episode, but certainly uh, fascism, national socialism and so forth illustrated the depths beyond low which one, one had hoped man could not go. Exactly. And in fact, you know, based upon observation historically, um, it, it does seem rather warranted to think that maybe there are no depths below which man cannot go, which is scary. 
Very scary indeed. 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 Now, Sarah is here, and Sarah, I can unmute Sarah. Wait a minute, I got it. There, Sarah, I'm unmuting you. Uh, yeah, so I'm really interested in the language of loss here and why he chose to speak about nature being lost as opposed to like estrangement. So yes, mm -hmm. some separation from God, but not total separation. Is that just part of his broader project of rejecting natural theology? Ah. Because reason as a rational faculty is so impaired. Right. Is he really rejecting natural theology? It's an interesting question. It, it, he certainly rejects more of it than others do. Um, you compare Pascal and St. Thomas, for example, and Thomas is obviously a robust advocate of uh, natural theology. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I think personally, okay, I'll give you my own answer, Sarah. I think that Pascal is overstating his case so as to make it. Because the rest, much of the rest of this book is about how there are all sorts of glimmers and clues and indications in human nature about man's meaning uh, and God and the purpose of the universe. And if man's nature and the universe are so full of clues and evidence, then maybe all is not lost. Um, but on the other hand, it's pretty badly damaged. It's severely damaged. It's grievously damaged. It's horrendously damaged. This is no mere bruising that human nature has experienced. And yet, I think he's overstating it, even in relation to his own view. I'm going to comment further, Sarah, before I go on to someone else. Um, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, I see that I've got David Thoreau, and I've unmuted David Thoreau. Except it's, it's Mary. Mary Thoreau. All I was going to add was the um, Chesterton quote about <clears throat> He who doesn't believe in God, it's the problem with he who doesn't believe in God isn't that he doesn't believe in anything, it's that he, he, he right. believes in nothing, means that nothing he, believe he in believes anything. in anything. Right, right, I mean, God, exactly. Also, um, the problem with this position is that for you to believe that nature is lost, you have some concept of nature as a real thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a ground to infer anything. So, if you say there's no ground, you can't infer. And the whole thing inverts and uh, contradicts itself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so that's why I think um, that he is deliberately overstating his case, because it's inconsistent with his own undertaking. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't learn something from the overstatement. I think we can learn something from the, from the overstatement. I think Pascal is... Uh, perhaps fighting and wisely fighting a point of view which has a kind of sanguine optimism about human nature and human history. Uh, it likes to think uh, how nice it is that integrity left in human nature and we can reason our way to good things and so forth. He's fighting a kind of uh, inappropriate optimism and I don't blame him for wanting to fight it. He's, he's challenging them. And yet, I don't think he's literally right, and I don't think he's literally self-consistent. All right, interesting point. Let me, let me go on. 400, man does not know the place he should occupy. He has obviously gone astray. He has fallen from his true place and cannot find it again. He searches everywhere, anxiously but in vain, in the midst of impenetrable darkness. Okay, so again, looking at this sort of precisely, I find it unsatisfying. I find it unsatisfying in the context of the pensées, but not unsatisfying uh, philosophically. Um, first of all, man does not know. Well, he does not know, that is to say, on his own terms, by himself, on his own, uh, it is, man is in a confusing situation. Um, I like to say that human beings winnow and grope for truth, uh, usually uh, unavailingly. And that seems to be certainly his view here. Uh, man just does not know. Um, and um, he searches anxiously in vain in the midst of impenetrable darkness. Okay, so the problem with this formulation 
in Pascal's terms themselves is the word impenetrable, right? The problem is in, in the word impenetrable because in fact, the darkness is not wholly impenetrable. He himself demonstrates that it's not wholly impenetrable. And yet, as a description of the existential experience of human searching, it's very compelling. Let us say that the word impenetrable here um, is aesthetically satisfactory um, and therefore more accurate than not uh, for that reason. Even though, if we read Pascal carefully, he finds uh, shafts of light penetrating the darkness. Bob, your comment. Well, I think, I think you're right, but I, I think Pascal is kind of making tradition. He has one of his chapters talking about the wretchedness of man or the wretchedness of our condition there. And I think he's kind of using the apologetic argument here that, or that others have oftentimes used to saying, what would things be like if there weren't any light from God or any of God's grace? If God's grace were not present there, what condition would man be here? And I think he's kind of going that step and talking about here, this is what things would be like if there were not, if it were not for the intervention of God um, into our history. Right and his grace into our history there. So I think he's kind of making a, he's not saying that this is what he believes is the condition. He's kind of saying this is, he's kind of taking a thought experiment in a way and saying this is what things would be like if, you know, and then he's going to give the altar, then he's going to come up with the uh, solution to that or the, or his resolution of that, you know, in a later, later on. So I right. think he's kind of using a kind of a, he's kind of using a technique here to, to make his point. Right. Um, those of you who were with us uh, two weeks ago um, may notice or may remember my comment that um, Pascal's approach uh, philosophically uh, into philosophical, philosophical theology is rather like that of a lock <clears throat> that a locksmith is trying to, you know, open. Um, nature is that way. Man's nature is that way. Um, on its own, uh, it's it's very hard to open a lock without a key. Uh, and there are many possible keys, but divine revelation is given to the Jews and to uh, the Christian church um, is the kind of key that fits the lock. Um, without the key, could the lock be opened? Probably not. Although you could, you could look in there <laughs> and if you had your you know, tools and your little mini flashlight and whatnot, you could probably figure out where many of the tumblers were but without the key, you can't really unlock it. So um, that's my, my own metaphor to try and make sense of this. In the midst of impenetrable darkness, existentially accurate, that's what I say. I condemn equally those who choose to praise man, those who choose to condemn him, and those who choose to divert themselves. I can only approve of those who seek with groans. Now, seeking with groans is what you would do in, in great darkness, um, even if the darkness had a few glimpses of light in it. Groans are appropriate. Um, what's not appropriate is triumphal progress. <laughs> Seeking with groans is, is a very wonderful picture of the human rational enterprise, uh, especially by contrast with a more triumphalist approach. Um, he doesn't think that man makes sense to praise man, <clears throat> to court, as they say in French, wholly, unqualifiedly. But those who choose to condemn man, that's not satisfactory either. The others choose to divert themselves, to amuse themselves. He doesn't admire any of those, but only those who seek with groans. The Stoics say, withdraw into yourself. That is where you will find peace. And that is not true. Others say, go outside, look for happiness and some diversion. And that is not true. We may fall sick. Happiness is neither outside nor inside us. It is in God, both outside and inside of us. Again, one of these beautiful, elegant juxtapositions. <laughs> Withdraw inside, um, forget yourself, and look outside. <clears throat> Which is it? Is peace, clarity, and connection, integration found by looking in or by looking out? Uh, and it's neither one nor the other. It is both, at least with this, with this God who is available to us uh, through the scriptures, portrayed in the scriptures. Wow. I was just going to say that the Buddhists, I think, would 
agree entirely with what the Stoics say. Mm -hmm. That's right. They would indeed. Who would who would agree with the alternative? I mean, what kind of philosophy would that be? Maybe outside. <laughs> These are simple summaries. I'm thinking mm -hmm. maybe pragmatism, uh, maybe Epicureanism. Uh, don't look in, we're just look out. Um, however, uh, it, with reference to Pascal's own uh, words here, of the two errors, which of them um, is less erroneous? <clears throat> Withdraw inside or look outside? Which is less erroneous, or to put it the same thing the opposite way, which is slightly truer than the other, if you had only those two erroneous choices, which would be the better choice. Um, it seems clear to me that the second error is less false than the first, because in fact, looking outside oneself is where one would look for God, um, because we are alienated and separated from God. Um, we, he is, we are not him and he is not us. <laughs> and therefore, looking to God is more of an outside look than an inside look. But it's the kind of outside look that becomes an inside look. Um, it's a very interesting uh, combination that we find. Uh, there's someone on the line called LBW. I am unmuting you, LBW. Okay, you are unmuted. I think I'm unmuted now. Well, one can't look within for God until one has been indwelt with the Holy Spirit, can one? That's precisely the first and you know the only way that he can get to the inside of us for us to look at. Yes, exactly. Precisely because of our alienation from God, according to classic Christian theology, looking within mm -hmm. is the wrong place to look. Uh, we won't find him there. Because we haven't been returned to that first nature yet. Yes, returned to that first nature. Wow, that's a pithy phrase. You must be philosophically trained, LBW. <laughs> <laughs> right. Returned right here. to that first nature. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to close that. I'm Kathy. Stephen's oh, mom. you're Kathy. Okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> Um, and I was going to say, uh, scripture talks a lot about um, how the, the general revelation through nature also reveals to us the greatness of God and his beauty and his goodness and order. Mm -hmm. So that's another way looking outside. And then when we look outside of ourselves, you know, each of us are kind of trapped in our, in our own me box and, you know, of self-centeredness and self-absorption. So when we look outside of ourselves and to help our neighbors, care about our neighbors, then that also helps us to see God mm -hmm. in other people. We get a sense of perspective and can lead us in a better path. Internal war of reason against the passions. Mm. Uh, this, of course, is a feature of classic Greek philosophy. Aristotle and Plato both argued that reason and just passion are you know, at odds with one another oftentimes. Um, split into two sects. Some wanted to renounce passions and become gods. Others wanted to renounce reason and become brute beasts. He says Barro. Barro, it turns out, was a notorious libertine of his era, probably well known in Parisian society. And he apparently embodies those who would renounce reason and become brute beasts. So which do we go with, reason or passion? Pascal says, neither side has succeeded, and reason always remains to denounce the baseness and injustice of the passions, <clears throat> and to disturb the peace of those who surrender to them. And the passions are always alive in those who want to renounce them. What a funny thing. <clears throat> uh, I like the first sentence especially. Reason is there to disturb the peace of those who surrender to passion. <clears throat> now, always remains to disturb the peace. Okay, going back to the previous slide about there's nothing fixed about human nature, utter plasticity. Remember that slide? Remember the previous one about uh, impenetrable darkness? Here, by contrast, he's speaking... Uh, less mm, elegiacly and more precisely, reason, he says, always remains to disturb the peace of those who surrender to the passions. 
always remains. If reason always remains to disturb the peace of those who surrender to the passions, then in fact, there's something about human nature which retains at least some basic features of its original integrity. Isn't that interesting? Because the reason is there to disturb the peace of those who surrender to the passions. <clears throat> of course, we should recognize, to be fair to Pascal, that the word always in that sentence itself um, could be taken with some qualification. Um, I think it's clear from what he says elsewhere, and let's just say clear from ordinary human observation, uh, that it is possible to so deaden and muzzle the voice of reason that its voice against the dominance of the passions may become very, very faint indeed, and maybe eventually extinguished. But it takes some, some, some effort, okay? Uh, this isn't exactly a substantive question, but do you happen to know which word Pascal uses for passions in this section? Um, I don't have the French text in front of me. I assume it's les passions, but I uh -huh. don't. Because sure. there are so many words in, in all the various languages which would have been relevant to this discussion, which there's differences in how we translate them into English. Yes, it's true. That's how we understand them. For instance, passion can have to do with the appetite or with the sp spiritedness. And that would have to do with its interaction with reason, whether uh, true passion versus false passion, etc. Yes. But I think, since we don't know that we can't explore it, but any thought I'd ask. Thank you. Um, well, we don't know on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think we, we do know, we can say something about it uh, because <clears throat> when he speaks of the passions here, and I'm gonna go on to the next sentence to make it clear, um, uh, he is regarding the passions um, with a more sort of um, embracing view than might have been the case um, with other philosophers because they're not all bad. So he says, the passions are always alive in those who want to renounce them. Now, I don't think Pascal is saying here that that's a bad thing. In fact, it'll become clear as we go on that indeed it's a good thing. It's a good thing that reason uh, is, well, shall we say almost always present to denounce the dominance of the passions. And it's a good thing that the passions are always alive in those who want to renounce them. What would it mean to renounce our passions? It would mean to become something less than human, actually. Um, we are designed to have passions, of course, appropriately directed. Um, I am reminded, not surprisingly, of St. Augustine, which I have uh, typed below there. Now, this is my interpolation. This is not in Pascal's text, but um, because I know he was a uh, a devotee and a student of Augustine, I'm reminded of what Augustine said in the City of God, Book 14, Chapter 7, the right will is therefore well-directed love, and the wrong will is ill-directed love. That's St. That's Augustine's formulation. It's consistent with Pascal. I love them both, personally, because um, with both Pascal and with Augustine, we get this understanding uh, that's so different from uh, Plato and Aristotle, from Cicero, from the high classics. So different because the goal is not to overcome this affective dimension of human nature. It is to properly deploy it and direct it. So love in Augustine, like les passions here for uh, Pascal and his pensées, uh, it's the affective dimension. It's the, uh, the desiring uh, affections, uh, the uh, moving sentiments, um, which can't be fully disentangled from desire. Um, this is the opposite of the Mahayana uh, Zen teaching that all desire is illusion. This is rather the teaching that all desire uh, is evidential, uh, that all desire is um, uh, redemptive, in fact, uh, that all desire, that desire uh, is at the heart of the human character and that the goal is to direct that desire, that affect, that love, that desire, that passion, to direct it well, um, as opposed to direct it ill. So trying to shear the passions off from oneself would be just as bad as giving oneself wholly to them. Probably that's because God himself is full of affect as well as rationality, and we are made in his image.
This seems to me quite consistent with human experience. And that's one reason why I like Pascal's teaching here. Okay, Bob. Uh, uh, now you come back to Lewis again here, or at least I, Lewis takes his, pokes his head in here, there where Lewis talks about our desire for something, this desire for joy or the seeking for joy as being a passion that directs us, that directs yeah. us out towards God there. And that it's that right. recognizing there's something beyond us, that, that, that right. we're looking for something that's beyond us. It's, it's like a major step to get us to God there. So I, mm -hmm. it's like, well, it's not like we're, so I feel, <laughs> I feel like if we're Lewis, we need, when Lewis sort of steps in here, I think we kind of, want to acknowledge that because he was probably one of the great proponents of, of the joy and the, being the, the driving force in his life for, for coming to become a Christian there. And the, yes, that's, exactly. That's the passions. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't surprised by dispassionate equanimity. He was surprised by joy. And it would be fair to add here uh, that the biblical vision of the passions um, does not uh, derogate them, but in fact raises them to what might seem maybe to a classical philosopher rather unseemly. After all, um, shall we say, the passion that seems to uh, gather a lot of our attention, uh, the, the desire for a lover, is itself described in the Bible as indicative uh, of something far greater than itself. So much so that the union of husband and wife is described as speaking to us as somehow embodying um, the love of God for his people and the love of Christ for the church, the love of the church for Christ. Um, that's pretty ennobling of the passion, that particular passion directed in that particular way, appropriately channeled toward its proper object, um, is an enormous indicator of the meaning of uh, human life. And thus, passion is redemptive. So let's not renounce them, but let's not be dominated by them either. Notice, however, that this whole picture here of the appropriate um, structuring of passion and reason is itself an enterprise of reason, right? <laughs> reason is actually still in the saddle in a certain way because reason, it's its province to understand the proper structuring of them. Of course, once reason figures out the proper structuring of reason and passion, then you actually have to implement it, which may be something other than a cognitive or surpassing a merely cognitive activity. He speaks of the causes and effects of love. This is one of the famous quotes. It, it's stuck in here in uh, 413, um, enigmatically and abruptly. Cleopatra's nose, if it had been shorter, the whole face of the world would have been different. Okay, someone speak up and tell me what Cleopatra's nose has got to do with anything. Why are we bothering to even talk about it? Oh, let me put the question differently. <clears throat> Which historical figure found the length of Cleopatra's nose to be an attractive asset? Well, more than one, really, and it was to a certain extent their rivalry over, you know, the disposition of the nose and to whom its graces would be given that uh, caused all that difference of the face of the world. And that was, of course, between Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Right, Caesar and Mark Antony both wanted that nose. It must have been a really wonderful nose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why, why is Pascal being so trivial here? Um, and silly. Well, he's not actually. His point is that love is a powerful force in human life and even in human history. Uh, without that nose, Mark Anthony might not have fallen in love with this last queen of Egypt. Um, his conflict with Caesar Octavian would then have taken a different form. The history of the Roman Empire and consequently that of Western Europe might have followed a quite different course. <laughs> So uh, love is powerful. And the point here is not to uh, lament the potency of love, but to demonstrate its power and inescapability, and thus the importance of properly structuring and directing it. Perhaps if Mark Antony 
had been a little more self-contained in the deployment of his attraction for that nose, he would have done better. Who knows? Anyway, uh, Cleopatra's nose. So you heard it here, folks, the importance of Cleopatra's nose, the philosophical, world historical significance of Cleopatra's nose. This is one of the summary statements um, uh, where he, uh, I'm not giving you all the context, so it's not entirely fair to him, but one of his baldest and most uh, straightforward statements of his view, not only do we only know God through Jesus Christ, but we only know ourselves through Jesus Christ. We only know life and death through Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot know the meaning of our own life or death of God or ourselves. Thus, without scripture, whose only object is Christ, we know nothing and can see nothing but obscurity and confusion in the nature of God and in nature itself. Um, he's obviously being faithful to the text of scripture and to the Christian tradition here by affirming that only through Christ can we know God, but he's also making uh, an epistemic argument in the second paragraph there. Without scripture, we can see nothing but obscurity and confusion in the nature of God and in nature itself. <clears throat> At this point, um, you should be anticipating what I would like to say about that final sentence. Mark. Okay, I, I'm not sure what you're aiming for here, but the, it's obviously the importance of scripture uh, in, 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 in defining our, our notion of, the, of, of what's true and what isn't. But beyond that, I don't know what you particularly have to say. Well, I'm reacting at this point, I guess, to the phrase, nothing but obscurity and confusion. Oh, I see. <laughs> You're laughing. Um, Why are you laughing, Mark? Well, we can, we can get a little bit beyond. After all, the other religions, for example, are not just obscurity and confusion. They do have something to say that was valid before Jesus came on the scene. Indeed. And, and so I don't think that that's a, a very proper statement actually right it, again it's one of those sort of aesthetically significant but philosophically overstated things mm. uh, that we find uh, in Pascal um, nothing but obscurity and confusion well his his um, soteriological claim in the first paragraph I think is clear and, and defensible in its own way the epistemic claim here in the second part um, it's like so many of the other things, impenetrable darkness, total plasticity. Well, the trouble is that Pascal himself is, is showing us ways in which even without having yet submitted to scripture, we can see indications. We can see, let's say, uh, uh, shadows moving. Um, we may, may not be able to see men, but we can see shadows moving, um, to quote uh, one of the gospels. Um, put it this way here. So I, if, I was, if I was trying to be sort of a, a precise philosopher, I would say that without scripture, uh, we cannot adequately know anything, nor can we satisfactorily resolve obscurity and confusion in the nature of God and in nature itself. All I did was introduce a little bit of precise language. And yet, my formulation is kind of dull, and his is very colorful. Um, I think we get the point. And again, it's kind of an ex existential point. Um, and existentially, he's right. <clears throat> 387, I should be much more afraid of being mistaken than finding out that Christianity is true than of being mistaken in believing it to be true. This is related to the famous wager, which we are just about to launch into in just a few more slides. Uh, you see the significance of this. It's, it's a, the whole wager put in one sentence. It's quite simple more afraid of being mistaken and then finding out that Christianity is true than of being mistaken and believing it to be true. More afraid of the one than the other. Um, we'll come back to that, but I think you can already see the, the meaning of it. Okay, so section 418 is quite long. I'm, I'm pulling out my copy of the Kralsheimer edition um, and uh, section, it's on page 149 in the Kralsheimer text. It's one of the longer Pense segments in the book. Uh, and I'll read you at least part of it that I've written here, maybe a, a little bit more. <clears throat> the argument is an extended one, but ultimately very simple. We know that the finite exists without knowing its nature, just as we know that it is untrue that numbers are finite. 
Thus it is true that there is an infinite number, but we not, do not know what it is. Again, this is Pascal's familiar claim of partial knowledge. In other words, not impenetrable darkness, but partial, incomplete knowledge. We do know that there is an infinite number. No, number is not, it doesn't end, it, it's just the nature of number. But we do not know what it is. It's an infinite sequence. Now I have already proved that it is quite possible to know that something exists without knowing its nature. Wait, is that true? Of course it's true. That's just human experience all the time. It is very possible to know that something exists without knowing its nature. We do it all the time. We bump up against things. We have no idea what it means that there are different atoms in motion and beside, behind, underneath the atoms are hidden quarks and behind the quarks are bessons or whatever. We encounter physical objects all the time without really knowing or understanding their nature. So that's, that's a pretty basic human experience. It is possible to know that something exists without knowing its nature. Okay, but you can see where this is going. You better not admit this preliminary point because it's gonna take you a long way in. Either God is or he is not. <clears throat> How will you wager, he asks. Reason cannot make you choose either. Reason cannot prove either wrong. Proof in taking the word in the strong sense. He doesn't mean there's no evidence uh, for his answer, but he does believe that you can't prove it beyond a possible doubt. His re uh, interlocutor responds, the right thing is not to wager at all then. And he says, but you must wager. There is no choice, you are already committed. <clears throat> what in the world does that mean? You must wager, there is no choice, you are already committed. He has a dialogue, in other words, between himself and uh, the gambling men of French casino salons uh, of the 17th century. Um, yes, he spent a lot of time in the later part of his life at the Abbey in Port Royal, but um, he understood fully what Parisian salon gambling life was like, and he is speaking to these people as if he knows them because he probably does. <clears throat> you must wager, he says to them. There's no choice, you're already committed. <clears throat> what does that mean? Somebody venture a guess. Well, surely to be alive is to have already committed to the wager. Mm -hmm. You are, as a living, thinking, breathing human being, you're already in the game. Yes, we're already in the game. And to be alive as a human, at least, is to already be on the pathway to death. That is to say, discovering the result of the wager. Exactly. So that you can't, you're, if you've already on track to discover the result, then you can't back out of going one way or the other. Yes, that is very good. That there's really not an option. There is no spectator position. Everyone's, everyone's a player. <clears throat> there's no choice. So, very interesting point. Um, let us weigh up the gain and the loss involved in calling heads that God exists. <clears throat> you know, heads versus tails, tossing coins. <clears throat> weigh up the gain and loss. Let us assess the two cases. If you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Do not hesitate then. Wager that he does exist. <clears throat> Wait a minute. If you lose, you lose nothing? Well, what he means there, I think, is fairly clear. If, in fact, there is no existence after this life, if you just you disappear, and that's that, then all that you might have wagered on the belief side, namely that there's an afterlife and you're going to be welcomed into God's presence by a personal God who himself has already been uh, incarnated, uh, dead, resurrected, descended into heaven, welcomed by that risen man. Um, if all that turns out not to be true, will you be worse off? No, because you won't even be. You, you lose nothing. <clears throat> but if you win, you win everything. So it's clear the way a rational better would bet. And thus, since you are obliged to play, you must be renouncing reason if you hoard your life rather than risk it for an infinite gain, just as likely to occur as a loss amounting to nothing. So in other words, even if you thought it was just as likely that it was all illusory and there was nothing but death and silence, uh, or on the one hand, or just as likely that there was a God like the Bible says, even if those were two just as likely, it would still, you'd be renouncing your reason if you hoarded your life rather than risking it for the infinite gain. Because all the benefit is on one side. 
this is interesting, at least get it into your head that if you are unable to believe, it is because of your passions, since reason impels you to believe and yet you cannot do so. Concentrate then not on convincing yourself by multiplying proofs of God's existence, but by diminishing your passions. Learn from those who were once bound like you and who now wager all they have. This is in response to people who say to them, well, I'd like to believe, um, uh, but I just can't. Um, he's responding to this. <clears throat> this is the other person talking. I confess, I admit it, but is there really no way of seeing what the cards are? And then Pascal replies to him, yeah, scripture and the rest, etc." The person replies, yes, but my hands are tied and my lips are sealed. I am being forced to wager and I am not free. I am being held fast and I am so made that I cannot believe. What do you want me to do then? I am so made that I cannot believe. That's what the other person says. Again, imagine the typical gambling Parisian in a salon in Paris. I am so made that I cannot believe. <clears throat> well, then he says, at least get it into your head that if you are unable to believe, it is because of your passions. Since reason impels you to believe in it, you cannot do so. Very interesting. It's a very interesting dialogue. It's a, it's a very contemporary kind of dialogue. This is not out of our reach. This is very much within our reach. Okay, so uh, he goes on to speak to this man, <clears throat> the gambler. Now, what harm will come to you from choosing this course? You will be faithful, honest, humble, grateful, full of good works, a sincere, true friend. It is true you will not enjoy noxious pleasures, glory, and good living. But will you not have others? Of course, good living, um, the adjective good there is used equivocally. By good living, he's referred to, referring to the Epicurean kind of life. But will you not have others? I tell you that you will gain even in this life, and that at every step you take along this road, you will see that your gain is so certain and your risk so negligible that in the end you will realize that you have wagered on something certain and infinite for which you have paid nothing. He makes a good argument. <clears throat> he makes a very good argument. They're afraid that if they try and turn away from being dominated by their passions that they won't enjoy good things, but then, of course, they will. Uh, it is sort of like Jesus talks about uh, being good things shaken down, running together, will be poured out into your lap. Um, if you give up your life for my sake, he says, you will have life in the world to come and in this life, um, uh, many blessings. So it seems clear uh, that the rational gamble is to choose, is to choose to believe in the God of the Bible. <clears throat> Bob, go ahead. Uh, sorry, but I have to at least raise the question of the fact that in many times, maybe not in 16th, 17th century Paris, but in many places in the world today and throughout history, there are becoming a, choosing to become a Christian and pronouncing your faith in God is, leads to persecution and an early demise, or at least maybe lots of t torture and other kinds of deprivation. So it's not just simply, uh, you know, I mean... I'm sure he's aware of that, but Very it doesn't good point. Seem to fit into this particular argument here so far. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, that's a very good point. Um, I should be able to, but he says you have to uh, risk and give your whole life. Um, and the, the argument becomes more poignant, but the logical structure doesn't change if, in fact, the uh, benefit of turning and trusting in God in this life is so great in the next life um, uh, that uh, it would still outweigh it um, logically. I don't mean to say that's an easy choice. It's a very, very hard choice. That's why Jesus calls it giving up your life. That's why the church was built upon martyrs who made exactly that choice. 423 <clears throat> uh, is probably the most famous saying of Pascal altogether. The three most famous ones are probably um, the, the part about the thinking read, the wager that we've just been discussing, and this one here, uh, well, maybe Cleopatra too, but this one here is the most famous of all. The heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. We know this in countless ways. Uh, in the French, it's quite beautiful. Le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. 
uh, ne connaît point means, you know, does not, emphatically does not know. The heart has its reasons. Now, there are people who have been captivated by this aphorism um, and have shorn it from the corpus of Pascal's work and taken it to mean something that Pascal does not mean. There are people who take this phrase by itself, again, uh, and claim that it means that the best human life is the one that follows its feelings. Um, that everything that really matters is the flow of our sentiment and not the cogitation of our mind. <clears throat> uh, that's not what Pascal is saying because the whole book is called Pensées, right? <laughs> Thoughts. <laughs> Nevertheless, one of the things which thought discovers is that the heart has reasons. Um, the heart's reasons um, are not necessarily incompatible with the reasons of the mind, um, but there's more to human nature than the cogitative process. We know that from experience. Pascal has told us that it has to do with love. Um, the passions uh, seen positively are a permanent part of the picture. But there is a, a dimension of human decision-making in human life which is not simply cognitive. And adequate cognition takes into account its perception of the non-cognitive dimension. How adequate would reason be if it only took into account the cognitive dimension when there was a deeper dimension in human nature? Such reason would be unreasonable. <laughs> so what reason discovers is that the heart has reasons of which reason knows nothing. His next statement is, it is the heart which perceives God and not the reason. That is what faith is. God perceived by the heart, not by the reason. Now, this is a very profound statement. And I want to make sure you don't misinterpret it. Um, the key word in 424 is perceive. The heart which perceives God, not the reason. So, for example, if someone said, well, what this means, if someone said, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be flippant and inaccurate here, but if someone said, well, what this means is that um, uh, you can't figure out who God is or that he exists by reasoning. You can only figure that stuff out by your heart. Someone might say that. But that's not what, what Pascal is saying. It's, he's not saying it is the heart which understands God's existence and not the reason. That's not at all what he's saying. The word perceive is a very powerful verb. Um, it means percevoir, it's very parallel in French as it is in English. To perceive God is to actually see him in a connective way, to perceive in a connective way. Um, it's not like, to, to quote uh, St. James in the Epistle of James, it's not like the demons who believe God and tremble. Um, they don't really perceive God in the way he means here. Um, it is uh, perceive, perceiving, uh, seeing in a connective sort of way, perceiving God in that way. Um, it's the heart that perceives God and not the reason. Reason can show us uh, beyond a, uh, any unreasonable wager. Reason can show us that we should wager that God exists and go toward him. But having figured out you know, the logic of that wager situation, then we have to actually go toward him. <clears throat> we can't be satisfied by saying, oh, well, chances are better that God exists and that he doesn't. And here's a bunch of reasons and evidence. Fine, I'm, I'm satisfied. No, how could you possibly be satisfied? You couldn't be satisfied because you would have discovered the likelihood of the existence of this person, which then resonates with deep chords within yourself. You would necessarily want to perceive him, not simply to rationally acknowledge him. Perceive is so much more than rational acknowledgement. It needs rational acknowledgement, but it is so much more than rational acknowledgement. What would it mean, for example, in ordinary human uh, experience, um, if you noticed that there was uh, a woman of your own, say you're a man, you notice a woman of your own age uh, who has the requisite qualities that you've been looking for, uh, has a good skill set, is likely to be able to contribute nicely to a joint income should you marry, uh, likely to be good at creating a home atmosphere that would be conducive to your aims and to children, 
and so forth. Um, and you know, you, you've ascertained that this woman is uh, not married and therefore potentially available for, for marriage. Um, and then you said to yourself, fine, I figured it all out. And then left off and had no contact with her. Would that be reasonable? That would be very unreasonable. It, it would be sort of factual inquiry without taking the step toward which factual inquiry points, which is to then perceive the woman, address her, develop a rapport with her, ask her to marry you possibly, become married, uh, engage in the wonderful uh, connection and embrace of marital love. Um, all of that is beyond the evaluative process at the, before the front door. What's the point of discovering the door there if you don't go through the door? Thus, that's what he means. The heart has reasons. It is the heart which perceives God and not the reason. This is what faith is. God perceived by the heart. Now, this is where this reasoning process of Blaise Pascal becomes very threatening, maybe very intimidating. Because if reason discovers the things that he says reason discovers, then there's a whole other chapter that the human being has to undertake besides just reasoning about it. <clears throat> going on a little bit here. This one's a flashback to the earlier section, but we're going to come back to perceiving in a minute. 446, if there were no obscurity, man would not feel this corruption. If there were no light, man could not hope for a cure. Thus, it is not only right, but useful for us that God should be partly concealed and partly revealed. Since it is equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his own wretchedness as to know his own wretchedness without knowing God. What's dangerous about knowing God without knowing your wretchedness? Okay. What's dangerous about that? Knowing God without knowing your own wretchedness, I guess, could um, perpetuate you to use God to justify nefarious ends. Um, yeah, excuse me, it could do that. Or, that'd be bad, short of that but still bad would be potentially to somehow think that because you knew God but you didn't realize what a wretch you yourself were, that you would be kind of a triumphalist, domineering sort. Even uh -huh. if you didn't, you know, um, what's the word, uh, uh, exploit another person, you still might be domineering and triumphalist. And that would be extraordinarily unpleasant and potentially dangerous for the reasons that you said. So walk with me to the next step if you want to. Um, what would be dangerous about knowing our wretchedness without knowing God? The same question? Yeah, same question, but in reverse. What would be dangerous about the reverse? Oh, knowing your wretchedness but not knowing God. Yeah, yeah. Ah. That's a more difficult question. It is a more difficult question. You're quite right. Okay. Uh, I'll get you off the hook if someone sure. else is. Uh, go ahead, David or Mary. Despair. I'll say. Yeah. If you really come face to face with your own wretchedness, or maybe also the wretchedness of the whole human race, but without seeing that God was in the picture somewhere, yeah, total despair. I mean, I'm so awful that. Uh, and we know where that can, that can lead. It leads to a really bad end. Um, philosophically, you could also explore it. Um, I would say that, for example, um, a writer like Thomas Hobbes um, was very good at seeing human wretchedness. Um, remember his famous summary of the state of nature? Uh, he said, in the state of nature, man is solitary, poor. No, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's Thomas Hobbes's summary. And what did Thomas Hobbes do with that? Well, he drew the conclusion that since without, since man is, man's life is by nature, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, uh, therefore people have to get together and create um, systems of dominance and power, which can keep everyone equally uh, cowering before the power lest this wretchedness erupt into mass chaos. And thus the book is called Leviathan, and that turns out to be historically now an um, image or metaphor for domineering totalitarian states of one kind or another. Um, that may not be where Thomas Hobbes intended to go, but that's certainly how the imagery works. Um, wretchedness without, without God leads to you know, systems of exploitation. Um, kind of ugly. 
But um, so, so, so we want to have know our wretchedness and we want to know God. Okay. Um, again, I'm going on here. So you see, Pascal is just not, not systematic. And so it's frustrating, but, but maybe it's good for the mind. You know, you have, to, you have to be as nimble as Pascal to go through this. I love this one. It's one of my favorite statements in the whole Pensees, even though it doesn't seem like it should be. The more intelligent one is, the more men of originality one finds. Ordinary people find no difference between men. Now, this has nothing to do well, directly with the previous high stakes paragraph that we were on, but it's very significant. This, as I take it, is deliberately uh, opposed to a much more standard sentiment. The sentiment goes like this. Um, I and my type are superiorly intellectual and the run of the mill of the human race are so unoriginal. They just don't get it. They don't have sophisticated differentiated minds like I do, like our small set does. They're this big herd of humanity. They're so unoriginal, but we are original. We are the deep thinkers. We're the sophisticates. All the rest of them are like a bland mass that we can't even distinguish among them because they're so unoriginal. That attitude is a familiar one. He turns it on its head. Such people, according to Pascal, are actually lacking in intelligence. Because if you're very intelligent, you are able to discover and notice all the unique originality uh, of human beings. Ordinary people find no difference between men, they all look alike. Ordinary people in this case are like the sophisticates who think that everyone is boring uh, or put on a different class analysis if you want. You know, there's a typical uh, disdain of the intellectual class for the bourgeoisie, the middle-class shopkeepers. They're so unoriginal compared to us. He says the more intelligent one, one is, the more actually penetrating uh, and observant the mind becomes, and the more you find that there is actually originality amongst all sorts of people. Instead of becoming dismissive of the bland herd, the more intelligent you are, the more you realize that the herd is not bland, because you see more. Your eyes are open. This is a kind of anti-elitist statement of a very original kind. Okay, enough said on that point, but I really do... I'm tickled by that when I read it. Okay, here's a section that um, we need to discover together, and then we're gonna come to a stop in about five minutes. Um, he describes these two kinds of minds, the mathematical and the intuitive. Okay, this may seem a little abstruse at first, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, he says, in the one that is the mathematical, Principles are obvious, but remote from ordinary usage, so that from want of practice, we have difficulty turning our heads that way. But once we do turn our heads, the principles can't be fully seen. But with the intuitive mind, the principles are in ordinary usage and therefore all to see. There is no need to turn our heads or strain ourselves. It is a, only a question of good sight, but it must be good for the principles are so intricate and numerous that it is almost impossible not to miss some. The reason why mathematicians are not intuitive is that they cannot see what is obvious in front of them. For being accustomed to the clear-cut, obvious principles of mathematics and to draw conclusions until they uh, have, and draw no conclusions until they have clearly seen and handled their principles, they become lost in matters requiring intuition, whose principles cannot be handled in this way. Mathematicians who are merely mathematicians, therefore reason soundly as long as everything is explained to them by definitions and principles, otherwise they are unsound and intolerable because they reason soundly only from clearly defined principles. And intuitive minds are merely, which are merely intuitive, lack the patience to go right into the first principles of speculative and imaginative matters, which they have never seen in practice and are quite outside ordinary experience. Okay, so going back, um, which kind of mind does he like better, the mathematical or the intuitive? I think the intuitive, even though he was a first-rate mathematician himself. Mm -hmm. He certainly is, this, this strikes us as a kind of vindication of the intuitive, because we're more used to you know, the primacy, or at least the sort of prestige of the mathematical. Um, but he does have this thing at the, at the bottom there, Mark, where he says that uh, 
uh, intuitive minds lack the patience that they should have to go mm -hmm. into first principles, mm -hmm. which they have never seen in practice and are outside ordinary experience. So he, he kind of has a critique of both. But if he had to, if you said, which does he prefer? And I think he prefers the intuitive. Yeah. I think, let's just say the intuitive is the sort of the underrepresented mm -hmm. in contemporary intellectual life, both then and now. Remember uh, the era of the enlightenment that he is close to. Uh, uh, there was the exaltation of sort of the abstract and mathematical um, the sense of intuitive mind is an interesting concept. Um, if you uh, read Aristotle on um, uh, these matters, you will see something similar in Aristotle. He talks about intuitive reason, um, which has capacities uh, that are not to be sniffed at. Uh, so he wants both, though, ultimately. He thinks that we need both, uh, and he doesn't want the intuitive mind to lack the discipline of the mathematical mind, but the mathematical mind by itself cannot intuit a large number of principles that are relevant to the analysis because it's, it is so precise. His comments here on this one remind me of um, uh, analytic philosophy, which is a term taken in the 20th century by a lot of um, formal philosophy departments. Analytic philosophy is characterized by its starting point always in careful extended definitions of every term. Um, that definitional analytic process has something to recommend it and uh, does, in fact, make some contributions. But if Pascal is right, then that approach may also miss some things that are equally important. David. One other interesting thing um, is that, um, and we've discussed this at previous meetings led by Paul Ashby, is that in the field of science, there are far more mathematicians who are Christians than in any other. In other words, mathematics is like the highest form of science right. because you're dealing with ideas. And as you go down sort of the pecking order or the, the hierarchy of science, the lowest is biology. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the field of science suffers um, when you you know, as you go down, you're, you're essentially embracing more and more naturalistic metaphysics. Mm -hmm. I don't think that really relates to what Pascal is talking about, but it is an interesting, mm -hmm. I think, um, insight that Paul Ashby's made. Mm -hmm. One might say that a mathematician is necessarily more tuned in to um, principles and relationships that are timeless and discoverable. Non-material, extra natural, and you know the, the I, you know Lewis described himself as um, at one point becoming an idealist, uh, realizing that ideas are independent, sort of platonic view. Right, and that was a stepping stone for him to embrace theism. Right, so there's a, there's an immaterial world that is true, and that we are constantly aware of. Mm -hmm. as human beings. That goes back to Pascal's point about um, the uh, utter reality that if you assume naturalism, you end up with um, an irreconcilable contradiction. Right. You have, and Planiga, who talks about properly basic knowledge, mm -hmm. is saying that before you infer anything, there are certain things that are intrinsically true, um, and that ground is from which we then proceed. And if you assume the opposite, you have to assume those probably basic concepts to then deny them, right. which right. leads you nowhere. Right. I would also observe that uh, Alvin Planiga, methodologically speaking, is um, a practitioner of analytic philosophy. That's right. I think he's been more influential because he subscribes to the mainstream Wittgenstein approach. Um, and you know, the, the, usual, the mainstream sort of looks down on classic philosophy. And that's one of the reasons why Lewis, who was trained in classical philosophy, had trouble with the analytic mainstream. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to continue. I'm going to actually leave... Uh, David and Mary's uh, mic open 
because they'll be probably wanting to say some concluding remarks in a little bit. So the, yours will stay open. Um, 513 uh, is on a different point. Uh, true eloquence has no time for eloquence. True morality has no time for morality. Uh, why would true eloquence have no time for eloquence? Um, that may seem enigmatic, but it is quite, um, it is quite accurate and also profound. Uh, it goes, the, the point is, like, is this, real eloquence is eloquence about something. It is eloquence with reference to some point of knowledge, some insight, some information. Eloquence is not about itself unless it's insignificant, unimportant eloquence. Eloquence is never about eloquence. It's about something else. So forgive me for telling a silly story, but to illustrate the point, um, some years ago, I was a professor at a university in Oklahoma, uh, and one of the, I think she was a senior student, um, she was talking to me after some kind of a public event, and I was asking her what her plans for the future were, were going to be. Um, very intelligent young woman, uh, sort of a sprightly personality, uh, a lot of poise. And she said, oh, I want to be a speaker. And I said, oh, well, that's great. Um, what about? <laughs> she says, well, I just want to be a speaker because, you know, I've just seen how speakers can make such a huge difference in people's lives. And I've been in so many meetings where speakers have been moving um, and they've really made a big difference. And I want to make a difference by being a speaker. <laughs> so I didn't know what to say, you know, and I was just thinking to myself afterwards, and I'm not giving you her name, obviously, but I thought to myself, wow, so normally to be invited to be a speaker, you have to have a reputation of having some knowledge or expertise or special specialization about some, something to talk about, but she just wanted to have an impact, you know. I fear that she was what maybe... Um, Socrates would have called a sophist because she was, she, she was in love with, with rhetoric. She was in love with the power of words. But Pascal's point here is that real powerful words are never about powerful words. They're about something else. Now, the part about morality is a little more obscure. True morality has no time for morality. In other words, the morality of judgment has no time for the random morality of mind. I think what he means here is that actually making judgments between what's better and worse and what's right and wrong is far more important than constructing systems of rational disquisition, systems of rational argument, a moral argument. A fine-grained moral system is less important and less significant than actually making moral judgments. But the last statement is perhaps the best of all, to have no time for philosophy is to be a true philosopher. Wow. Um, this is very intimidating and threatening if you think about it carefully. Extraordinary, extraordinarily threatening. Um, I have a PhD in political philosophy. Uh, I was in a political science department, but I had a lot of friends who were getting their PhDs in the philosophy department, and I've known many philosophers, professional philosophers. Professional philosophers have a remarkable tendency as a group, not individually, but as a group, to be detached, to have a very detached air they are always analyzing this or that. They're always trying on different uh, interpretive frameworks in one way or another, different definitional systems. Um, they love philosophy. But of course, to be a real philosopher is to be a lover of not philosophy, but of truth. And so um, if you're a true philosopher, you regard the end and purpose of philosophy as being something other than and higher than philosophy, right? Um, a true philosopher is on the search for the meaning of the purpose of the purpose of existence. Once he discovers it, he doesn't just giggle and go on. He heads right in. And thus Pascal would urge us to do. <clears throat> he says there are three ways to believe reason, habit, inspiration, Christianity, which alone has reason does not admit as its true children, those who believe without inspiration. It is not that it excludes reason and habit, quite the contrary, but we must open our minds to the proofs, confirm ourselves in it through habit, while offering ourselves through humiliations to inspiration, which alone can produce a real and salutary effect, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. That's Pascal's words. 
I give you the full verse that he's quoting, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Of Christ called me, says Paul, to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Um, the word inspiration could be misleading to a contemporary reader. We think of inspiration as sort of, oh, I have a sense of inspiration. I have a, I have a sens- sentiment or sensibility of uplifting feeling. That's what we mean by inspiration. That's a subjective definition of inspiration. Pascal is using an objective definition. What he means is the supernatural influence of God through the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That's what he means by inspiration. Just like when people speak theologically of the inspiration of scripture, they don't mean how uplifting it feels when I read it. When they say inspiration of scripture, they mean they're referring to the objective claim that a God outside time and history um, caused these words to be recorded um, with uh, truly reliable information. That's what inspiration means in that context. Similarly, in this context, the supernatural influence of God. He says that Christianity does does not admit as its true, true, true children those who believe without inspiration. Now, I think you can see the significance of that sentence. Um, He's not interested in people who believe, i.e., who merely cognitively identify and affirm through propositional statements certain true things about God and man. That's not the true children of Christianity. Instead, it is those who may have that, but who also have, and even more importantly, actual contact with the supernatural influence of God, the Holy Spirit, which doesn't exclude reason. Contrary, we must open our minds to the proof and so forth. But we must then offer ourselves, offer ourselves. In other words, not just a cognitive affirmation, but you go beyond cognitive affirmation and and offer up yourself. Uh, This reminds me of the words of the classic uh, liturgy of Holy Communion uh, used um, throughout the Catholic world, including the English church, uh, where we offer ourselves to God because he's offered himself to us. You have to offer yourself to God. through humiliations if necessary, which can produce a real and salutary effect. So in other words, just like Paul, Blaise Pascal wants to offer the news about Christ, not with merely wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Of course, you say I interpolated even St. Paul there to try and make the Pascal meaning more clear. Uh, It's not that St. Paul himself did not use words that were coherent and intelligible. If you read St. Paul, He's probably the most angular and more, most Hellenically trained of all the New Testament writers. He does use words with power and coherence. But his goal was not simply to offer intellectual and cognitive power, but uh, having words that have the power of the cross of Christ in them. And so was Pascal. That's why I say this, to say that same thing as he said a few slides ago, the true philosopher is the one who doesn't care about philosophy but kind cares about the findings of philosophy, not about the philosophic process. Um, he says here near the end of the section, there is no denying it. One must admit that there is something astonishing about Christianity. It is because you were born in it. They will say far from it. I stiffen myself against it for that very reason for, for fear of being corrupted by prejudice. But though I was born in it, I cannot help finding it astonishing because to summarize, it has all these incredible juxtapositions. It holds intention all these insights that are gleanable from so many sources. It holds together our wretchedness and our glory. It holds together our smallness and our immensity of our, of our rationality. It holds together our physical nature and our un- immaterial supernatural nature. It pulls it all together in the incarnation. Um, it is astonishing. Okay, so that's the end of my discourse for the evening. Let me pause now, and and since I can't open up everyone's mic without cacophony, let's get a bunch of hands for some final comments or questions. What what I find uh, behind this there, this is not a philosophical tome by any means. As as you said, by the nature, it's pensées. It's various thoughts at times and various times and places in his life. You know, maybe if he had lived a lot of years longer, to me, it pulled us together. But what's kind of the, because this is kind of like, almost unfiltered kind of stuff. And he gets one of the reasons for these extreme statements that don't all hold together coherently, if you, in a strict sense, is because they're, they're thoughts. And it's like, mm-hmm. you go in one direction, you go a little different direction. And at some point, you maybe put them together. That's up to the reader. But I think if we didn't have that 
the extremes here, we would lose a tremendous amount of of what he has to say, and to lose, and it's and the thought provoking, the things he say that are unsettling are oftentimes because it's kind of this first unfiltered kind of thing. So I right. think in this sense, it's kind of almost like a first modern work there, because this is yes. the kind of idea of of sort of having the filter without having the strong editorial influence sort of comes became something that people were doing later on. But anyway, I just I just think it's I think it's very interesting that it's just it's refreshing to hear this kind of you know these kind of someone who's got a mature faith with these kind of extreme thoughts there without heavy editorial uh, and yes, exactly. effort to try to bring a philosophical coherence and make a systematic theology out of it, which is definitely not that, the opposite of that. Interestingly, um, and maybe uh, uh, counterintuitively, I find something similar in the effect and style of the Ponces uh, to what I find when I read uh, much of Aristotle's work, because Aristotle's work um, is pulled together after um, his death, apparently, by many of his students. Um, Aristotle's writings are, they're systematic in their content, but the way they write, the way, he, the way they are written, um, he jumps back and forth a lot. Um, and, and one has to supply the system, even in reading Aristotle, at least in parts. Um, how much more uh, with Pascal? Uh, Jonathan Harris has his hand up. Yes, hi, are you able to hear me? I can, yeah. Great. You know, in, um, in the earlier you were talking about the read, so I quickly looked it up on my Kindle. And at the rest of the section, which uh, interested me, reminded me so much of uh, Thomas Traherne. And I looked at the dates, and they lived almost at the same time. And Thomas Traherne wrote uh, Centuries of Meditation. And they both had the same thought. I think in that passage about the read, he goes on to uh, Pascal goes on to say that what he was so excited about is that his uh, his thoughts allowed him to understand the universe and see it at a at a, a larger scale. That no matter what he no matter by whatever powerful force was out there that could crush him like a reed, he was able to see beyond that. And that was the same as Thomas Traherne, who also had these thoughts. And I, I guess um, I was intrigued by the contemporary nature of the idea of writing down these thoughts, these spiritual thoughts that are more like in a diary format. Mm -hmm. And it seems like before this overall generation or time, you don't really get that kind of, seems very modern in that way, mm -hmm. um, very blog-like. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I thought that was both interesting that both of them in the idea of thoughts, it's not the, he's not using the word reason, but thoughts, which is kind of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, I was confusing the two terms, thoughts and reason, but there he gets excited. There's that hint of excitement, um, which is more ecstatic, I thought, in his read statement. And it's very mm -hmm. similar to Thomas Traherne. I would have loved to see them both at the same table talking. That sounds great. Maybe that'll happen someday. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. They probably are. <laughs> yeah, Pascal is right. It probably is happening. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah, and just following up on that, um, I think you can see at a whole series of points in this discussion, I tried simultaneously to show you how um, Pascal, at odds with himself, uh, if one took him too literalistically, but uh, profoundly insightful, if one understood the equivocal and provocative intent in some of the formulations, uh, aesthetically true, and then ultimately philosophically true too, although requiring more precision. Anybody else with a thought? I'm watching my hands up. We, we've, we had 24 participants, now we have 15. A few people had to leave, but I'm grateful for the, the faithful remnant here who hung in with us. I think that we are not getting any more hands raised here. Thank you so much to all of you for listening attentively, patiently with me with this uh, somewhat unfamiliar uh, technological interface. It didn't work half badly, all things considered. Um, really th we really thank you for taking the lead on this, Graham. Yes. And okay, well, thanks everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Graham. God bless uh, you. See you next time. I'm muted so the clapping won't come through, but. Right. Okay. <laughs> Understood.
Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Bye. Thank you.